is going to present the paper. Thanks just for, very much uh, for introducing. Um, hi there, I'm Florian Deiber. I'm from the German Research Center for Artificial Intelligence. And on behalf of my colleagues, Felix Kosmala, Frederick Wier, Antonio Krüger, I will talk a little bit about in situ visualizations uh, for understanding climbing movements. Uh, yeah, I hope we, you're um, kind of get uh, to an end until the session, so it's a little bit late. <laughs> Good, so this is how climbing in the old days looks like. Um, this was the first ascent of Matterhorn in uh, 1865. Um, and uh, back in these days, uh, climbing was a real adventure, like fighting against the forces of nature. So these adventurers used very simple gear, like hemp ropes and um, some ice axes that doesn't look like the ones we know today. and um, yeah, falling was actually not an option um, and would result in serious injuries or even death. Uh, in case of this expedition, um, four of the seven members uh, died during the ascent, uh, during the descent, sorry, while cli uh, climbing down. So today it looks a little bit more like this. So there's lots of gear available, which makes climbing much safer. Um, yeah but there's also even more accessible ways uh, why climbing is so popular today. And one uh, possible way to do it nowadays is uh, bouldering, uh, especially indoor. Gyms are easily accessible um, for almost everybody. And bouldering is a variant of climbing that is done at low heights. As you can see, um, you're climbing up to four meters or so, and there's uh, thick mats that uh, prevent uh, falls, um, so you don't need much gear ex except shoes, you don't need anything basically. And um, the objective of, of a climber uh, is to kind of solve a, a three-dimensional movement problem, so to say, um, by kind of using only a, a predefined set of holes, um, which is then, uh, uh, yeah, we call, call it problem or route um, in, if you uh, think in climbing terms. Um, in order to kind of solve those kind of problems, uh, you need to acquire a certain set of uh, special climbing techniques um, that are especially um, hard to learn for beginners. Um, so it's not about like powering up the wall, but uh, um, solving the problem in a kind of graceful and energy efficient uh, way. And this is how people today learn uh, those kinds of climbing techniques, which is basically done by demonstration. So we have one experienced climber um, or instructor who kind of shows uh, how, to, how to do it, how to climb, how to move, basically. And um, the trainees, as you can see here, just watch him and then afterwards try to try to mimic his movements, try to repeat what, 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 he, what he has done. And this could be problematic because uh, sometimes the, the trainer is blocking the wall so you don't see any nuance of the, of the movement uh, or you cannot see any uh, foothold he's using or, or handholds. Um, another thing uh, that is, for example, other than uh, for, for other sports, the trainee cannot climb in parallel. Like, for example, in ballet or martial arts, uh, the trainee can kind of make the movements in parallel to what the instructor is doing. And so they have to wait and then try to yeah, do it again. And so it's sometimes hard to remember every every move and every step, especially if it's a very complex movement like uh, twist in, bending your knee or, or something else. And thus our main motivation was uh, now to use technology to kind of provide an in to feedback while climbing to um, help the user uh, or the climber instantly while doing certain movements to help him, guide him basically up uh, the, those short climbs. 
So, although this work is also inspired from uh, sports uh, literature, namely video feedback and expert modeling, uh, I will only uh, uh, jump over some HCI-related uh, work, um, but please check the paper for uh, more details. Um, so, there has been some work on uh, movement guidance and how to basically augment um, information to help people in uh, um, rehabilitation. Um, one example is Physio at Home, where a, a high accurate uh, tracking system was used to track the, uh, the, the users or the patients in this case, and then uh, a screen was used to kind of give them feedback on how to yeah, extend the, their arm movements back in a physiotherapy uh, exercise. Uh, very similar, but more like uh, augmented uh, reality was used for um, suicide al. So they also tracked a user with a, a high precision tracking system, but they projected onto his arm and uh, around the user some information on how to, how to perform the different exercises. Slightly different approach was uh, done by uh, Soji et al. Um, the light guide here, uh, the, the information was projected on the hand. And um, in a study, um, it could be shown uh, that more than like 85% uh, accuracy could be achieved uh, with this augmentation compared to a video, compared to classical video feedback, so to say. Um, there's also been some uh, work in uh, HCI in sports. Um, so there's, I just took only two examples, uh, but there are some more. Um, one uh, really nice uh, system is the U-Move because it's also a really uh, nice piece of hardware. So there's, uh, it's an augmented mirror that can be either used as a mirror or uh, as, a, as a display by um, kind of uh, making it transparent uh, so that it uh, can be uh, used as a mirror or not. And uh, this was used to kind of um, yeah, um, support the, the user to train different, different movements and there was some nice augmentations and it was like more like a game-like game approach. And there also have been many um, many works in climbing nowadays. So um, from the beginning, uh, augmentation has been envisioned uh, to teach uh, climbing movements. Uh, so there were mainly two active groups, so the group of Perto Hamelinen and, uh, and our group. And we kind of both envisioned this and uh, work around uh, the climbing topic, climbing HCI. And the augmented climbing wall is a normal bouldering wall that is uh, yeah, equipped with a projector and, a, and a, a Kinect, so you can track uh, the climber and um, yeah, project some, some graphics, and uh, they mainly use it for, uh, for climbing games, and now also trying to build a business out of it. So let's get back to the main idea. So as I already said, we uh, like to use uh, in situ feedback during the climb um, and help the climber to um, get an idea of what to do next while on the climb. And yeah, it, so the feedback by demonstration is directly performed during the climb. And so, therefore, we uh, designed. Uh, two different visualization techniques, um, the life-size um, view and the third-person view. For third-person view, we also um, built uh, two display methods, one that is a display that is directly projected onto the wall, and another one that uses Google Glass as a variable display. The life-size uh, shadow view, um, basically projected a life-size version uh, of the instructor on the wall, as you can slightly see here. And 
since it was recorded with the same camera, it was really uh, in place and accurate uh, projection. And uh, for this, we used the, the beta cube we um, presented last year um, at Kai. The augmented third person view, as I already said, um, used uh, a display where we have the, where you can maybe slightly see uh, the climber sees herself uh, from behind in third person, and the instructor is also um, projected onto the climber so you can directly compare what he's doing, what the instructor is doing, uh, and so on. And uh, there we built two options. One is the projected display, the other one is the, the Google Glass. Good, uh, we um, not uh, showed the whole climbing sequence of the instructor at this, uh, at this, uh, as a video, but we looped uh, certain sequences, so each kind of a step was uh, looped in a, a small uh, chunk of, of video. As soon as the climber proceeds, the next uh, uh, video loop, uh, sequence um, will start, and so you can continuously uh, check the next um, the next uh, steps to do. Um, so, of course, we did a user study to assess the effectiveness and user experience of our feedback methods. Um, therefore, we run a controlled lab experiment, so we are not really in the wild, so we have this small climbing wall in our lab. It's four to three meters, four meters wide, three meters high. And um, we use the uh, beta cube system for the life-size shadow projection, uh, plus uh, an extra projector to pr uh, project the display in a high resolution. So we could have also used this uh, projector, but then uh, the resolution was not good enough, and so we want to have a, uh, a nice output, a nice uh, high resolution screen next to the climber. Um, we had 12 participants. Uh, they all were uh, have never climbed before or were really novice climbers. They uh, at maximum, they were allowed to climb uh, one time or two. Um, the conditions uh, are the three uh, visualization methods I already talked about, plus uh, a baseline condition, the classic approach where a, a human instructor uh, presents how to climb the route and uh, gives uh, a demonstration. We, of course, um, let then uh, climb, uh, let the participants climb routes, um, namely four, and we uh, did video and audio recording for later analysis. The study procedure was as follows. Uh, for, before each uh, condition, they were asked to do a, a short training task. I will quickly show you later. Um, then they climbed the first condition, uh, training task, second condition, uh, until they had climbed all four conditions. So the conditions, um, yeah, and there was the interview afterwards, but uh, the conditions were counterbalanced, but the routes, the different problems that we defined um, didn't change. So we only uh, counterbalanced the visualizations, uh, which ended up in four times uh, three trials per participant. So here you can see the training task, um, which was basically, here you see the Google class version. So they had, just to um, do the movements while standing on the ground. So um, grab a, a hold or um, a touch a foothold with their, with their foot and so on. Uh, just as a training task to get used to the, the visualization technique. The climbing techniques or routes um, are those four. So these represent um, standard problems that um, especially beginners uh, should know and uh, that really help them uh, to get better climbers and that's what they learn also if they take a small climbing course uh, by uh, human instructors. Uh, so I don't really want to go too much into detail because of the time. Um, there's some uh, techniques where they twist lock like bending in, there's a technique that um, where they have to um, kind of change their balance uh, over their food. There's the flagging technique, which uh, improves their balance, and the outside X, another balance, uh, uh, yeah, 
another technique to, to get a uh, stay in balance. So um, after the, they performed uh, the different uh, climbing uh, problems, um, we did a semi-structured interview, mainly focusing on the visualization techniques and finally asked them to rate the different approaches. So um, we got different feedback, uh, in qualitative feedback, uh, so um, it was all like um, double-sided, so um, for all methods there were pros and cons, and for example, uh, some participants uh, appreciated the human feedback as more direct, more helpful, more communicative, it's an, a person that uh, kind of helps, uh, helps them. But they also really liked um, that um, they, if they have a problem while on, on the climb, they can easily get, a, get an idea of what to do next and uh, were also kind of liked it. So there are al always both sides of the medal. Um, especially for life-size video, they really thought it was easy to understand and uh, to adapt to. Um, but they kind of complained that it was uh, back projected, so there were some occlusion problems. So some people don't like the occlusion problems because uh, as soon as they don't see uh, the shadow anymore, they know that there must be right. But they kind of propose, for example, back projections, like, uh, which definitely indicates that they're kind of not happy with, uh, with the back, proje uh, back projection. Uh, with the front projection, sorry. Um, for the uh, display conditions, um, there were some uh, problems with the context switches, especially for Google Glass, because you couldn't use Google Glass while looking at the wall. They always have to um, uh, turn their head and kind of refocus, uh, try to uh, see something in the small display. Um, and this doesn't work that much. Uh, so Google Glass wouldn't be an option. Uh, let's say it like that. Um, the ratings, uh, although they had some really uh, strong arguments against it, where they, uh, most of the users preferred life size. The second uh, best was display and human and glass kind of on the last uh, places and uh, in the end. Um, this kind of contradict, uh, contradiction, but yeah, maybe there's a novelty effect or they c could really uh, live with the drawbacks of the, of the approach. Good, uh, we also did a manual video recording analysis afterwards and compared how they improved uh, from the first uh, try where they didn't get any assistance uh, until the third try. In, on the second try, they got the assistance with the different methods, and here you can see, in this case, the, uh, the climber actually approved a lot. So he like, was hopping on his knee, and I think this hurt a lot, and in the third try, he got it. Um, I think I have to skip over this, but we uh, have some improvements. Please uh, check the paper for more details, um, and for some discussions uh, why the different improvements might uh, have happened. And uh, with that, I come to my conclusion. So um, life-size projection um, works best for all. Projected display was good when it was in the, in the right uh, place, um, since it was always in a fixed position relative to the user. And Google Glass doesn't work at all. And um, yeah, we as a future work or as a conclusion, we kind of envision a context-sensitive hybrid approach that maybe combines like uh, life-size projection with projected displays and then decides on uh, what to use in the current situation, what might be better, what might be more suitable, so to say. And another uh, um, thing we like to work on is like um, using those kinds of uh, video feedback uh, methods um, for in, in virtual reality and see how we can use this kind of yeah, um, output technique or display technique uh, to help the people to engage more in what they have to do beforehand, before climbing. Or they can also use VR while climbing. Let's see. Okay, with that, uh, thanks for 
attention, and I'm happy to take questions take if there's some time left. We've got, we've got time for one question. Right here. One question, anyone? No, I'll get. Oh yeah, uh, Jens, do you want to switch over, fly? Thanks a lot, uh, Jens Kubot, Kubot University of Applied Sciences. Um, you just said in the end, in, in, in between, that uh, the Google Glass version was basically uh, not, not uh, working as anticipated. Uh, uh, can you give us some more details? Was it basically uh, the, um, the focus switch that needed to take place, or the different focus depths, or the, the small inlay, or uh, can you uh, give us some more so, details? Yeah. So we think there, this was more than one uh, problem, so it was this small resolution of the display and um, the, the grayish uh, climbing wall somehow uh, uh, makes it almost impossible to use it while uh, looking at the wall. So each uh, user has to kind of turn her head uh, towards a black uh, 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 background environment and then it works quite well but then they're kind of decoupled from what they're actually done and this is there was really hard context switches and that's what we think is the mo most important problem. Maybe other um, heads-up displays might be uh, better uh, in terms of quality, but this could be a problem for sure. Okay, thanks.